like for you to please stand with me. Mr. Man, will ask Brother Steve if he will come and read from the Word of God. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation in the house of his servant David. And he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began, yeah. that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember His holy covenant, the oath which He swore to our father Abraham. Yes, He did, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. May you bless the reading of your word. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You have your Christmas tree up yet? <laughs> I heard you know there. Do you, do you have the decorations over the door? The wreath? Ready? Anybody go Christmas lights watching? Uh, old tradition, really, we didn't have it, but, but with the Blee's family, we went out of, of every dark street I think we could find just looking for lights. But we did see some. We saw some beautiful lights, and we, it begins to get you into the, the festive mood of the season as you begin to see these things, you begin to do it within your own house. It's, it's just, it brings about a time that you, that you long for. It brings up a lot of memories, too. I think that's a special part about it. It's not just anticipation, but a lot of it is looking back. I remember when, and, and it brings up such good memories. Can you imagine if you did all these things, all the interactions that you've had, all the things that you saw, and you couldn't say one word? You see it. All you can do is point at the lights. I guess maybe you can do jazz hands. It's really you know, exceptionally good. But I mean, you can't say it. Can you imagine that? How much this holiday season would be different if you couldn't say a word? You couldn't speak. You couldn't, you couldn't say to your loved ones, well, that's good or that's bad. That, was that a good move? Mm -hmm. That's all you could do. You literally couldn't say a thing. What a dramatic difference it would be. How would you celebrate in your heart? How would you feel? Would you, would you feel the same? Would you, would you be excited? Would you have the same fervor as you had before? Because you could not express what you felt in your heart. It is a, it is a limitation that thankfully most of us, if not all of us, really will never know. I have, I have lost my voice at times, and, and that's been difficult just to, you know, it's difficult sometimes to keep a preacher's mouth closed, but it is possible. So it, to, to convey, it's an instant barrier. It's an instant difficulty. And so it affects everything around you. Well, that's the situation that we find in our story today. And as we, as we continue to, to look at, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. We see, again, the setting that Jesus came into. We focus on Jesus, and rightly so, but if we focus on Jesus, we'll kind of forget His mission. Because Jesus came for a reason, Brother Jimmy. He came on mission. He came on point. And He came, as we saw last week, in the fullness of time. He didn't come a day late. 
And he didn't come a day early. He didn't come in the wrong year. He didn't come in the wrong century. He didn't come to the wrong people in the wrong place. He didn't do that. He came in the fullness of time, the Scripture says. He came at a time where everything would work out right. And 2,000 years, he's still defining our world by his life. What a, what a, what a testimony to the fullness of time that he was born into. But not everything was all nice and, and, and sweet like this less good nativity that we have right here. Not everything was orderly. Not everything was in its place. There were some difficulties going on. Tragedies. And here you have one today. Zacharias the priest. It's a wonderful privilege to have your turn and, and go into the temple and, and offer incense to God. But as he's going into that temple, he's going to a God that denied him a child. Year after year after year after year after year after year. No baby. He's an old man now. You can imagine he's broken. He may be praying. I can't say that he's not praying one more time. Oh God, still give us. But I, I kind of doubt it. If he does, it's just a ritual. I'm just coming. I'm going to throw that incense on the altar. I'm going I'm to I'm do my, my rope prayer. I'm going to walk out of this building and go back to my wife. With my barren wife. My childless family. Into the traditions where everybody's just got a pall on them. Rome is in control. We pay their taxes. We're not free. We're, we're under oppression. Everything is just not perfect. There's no angels singing. There's no glory. The crowd's still smelly. The day is still hot. And here I am without a child doing the Lord's will. And what has that ever gained me? Something changed in that moment. Somebody invaded his life. He took a step beside the altar and says, I have something to say to you, Zachariah. I have something you thought you would never hear, but I'm here to say it. You are going to have a child. See his reaction. No. You didn't read that. Read it later. It's a wonderful story. I love how he talks back to the angel and says, So what? I want some proof, man. Come on, I'm an, I'm an old man. I'm way past easy believism. You've got to do something for me. You've got to prove to me that this is real and not some fantasy or, or I've sniffed too much incense up my nose or something. You've got to prove it to me. Okay, I'll prove it to you. When Zechariah walked out of that building, he not only walked out having met an angel of the Lord, he came out not able to say one word. I wasn't in there, Zechariah. What did you see? What did he tell you? He can't say a word. He can't go to that neighbor across the street and say, I'm going to have a child. He can't go to his wife and say, I love you. He's mute. Can't speak. He is now not only asked of God and served God, but now he's got mute. He's, he's mute for the privilege of serving God. Something's going on, but even Zechariah could not understand what God was doing. But he had nine long months to think about. Can you imagine how much thought you're going to think when you can't speak? When you can't converse and there's no, there's no American Sign Language back in ancient Israel, so I guess it was a lot of appointing, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff. But he can't converse with his soul. He can't, he can't talk about his frustrations. He can't, he can't do anything verbally for nine whole months, but he did leave with something that was not true when he walked in. He walked out with hope. He walked out with a spark of hope. I don't think he went out leaping. I don't think he went out with his arms up in the air. But he went out mute. But the angel said something. And I'm going to grab hold of that. And when his wife Elizabeth told him, something's stirring. Something's happening that hasn't happened before. He can't praise God. He can't. He can't shout hallelujah. He can't. He can't go around the neighborhood and spread the news. He is in that position. A mute, still broken, oppressed man. But he's got hope. 
He's a good picture, and I think that's why God chose him for it. He's a good picture of Israel, really. You know, really. I mean, here's an old man that hasn't had a baby and has done God's service, but it hasn't proved to be anything for him. Israel's kind of the same way, isn't it, church? 400 years, they've known politics. It hasn't worked out so great. They've known revolution. A little freedom, but not a whole lot. Rome still got their foot on top of this nation. They're still having to serve them. And literally, if they walk down the street and the soldier says, you're going to do this for me, your day is stopped. You're jerked to where he wants you. You don't even have control of your day because you are under somebody else's foot. And it's been a long time since Malachi. It's been a long time since the prophet of God has said, here's what the Lord says. So Israel's just kind of stooped over they're kind of mute themselves. They don't have a praise. They have a tradition, but they don't have a praise. They've got a routine, but they don't have a praise. They've got a, a manner of doing things, but they don't really have anything to say. They're just a oppressed, broken, one more little people under the great Roman Empire. God is about to change. God was about to do something to show them that everything was going to change. He's an image. And for nine years, nine months, he thought about what was going on in his life. And finally, the delivery time comes. Finally, he has an opportunity to see the promise fulfilled. But it's been building up to this day. It's not like it's it's just oh, it's, it's a, just a sober realization. He sees that belly growing every day. And he knows what that means. He knows it's anticipating. It's getting a little closer and a little closer and a little closer. And you can imagine the excitement welling up with him because it's no longer faith. It's no longer hope. He can literally see it beginning to come to pass. And all it needs is that day, that time, that hour, and the promise that was given to me is going to be fulfilled. The old woman Elizabeth had birth pains. And out came a baby boy. But that's what the angel said. You're going to have a son. And I'm going to give you his name. Sorry, throw all those baby books away. I'm doing this one for you. His name shall be John. Because I have a purpose for him. It's not just a baby. It's not just your son. It's my chosen vessel. I am doing something in this day and I have made my choice of the setting that my plan is going to be fulfilled in. So, the birth happened. But just like God is wont to do, a, a birth kind of interrupts events, doesn't it? I mean, everything just stops. It's for a happy thing. Going to the hospital, everything stops. Everybody heads to the hospital. One year ago, we had our first nephew. It was snowing up there, too. Y'all pray for Lee. It's tough on him. Not seeing that snow. But last year was tough on him. Baby, snow, power outage. All at the same time. You talk about life stopping. We were able to see that life growing. Growing like a weed in North Carolina. Air is unfortunately good for him. He's growing. You see the life and it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to see that. And that happened to Zachariah. Here's the baby. Here he is. And everybody's all a buzz. Everybody's all a Twitter. Everybody's all talking about Elizabeth. Talk about Zachariah. But it's not done yet. The birth didn't change anything, did it? Zachariah couldn't say, my boy. He still can't say anything. He may have learned some better sign language, but... He still can't say a word. But something's got to be done. He's got to say something. He's the man of the house. He's the father. Now, now, Zechariah, these people are wanting to name him John. I know this, this, this has been a rough birth on Elizabeth. She's not thinking straight. There's nobody in your family named John. This is a, a why would you pick such an odd name? Honor your family. Honor your traditions. Honor what it is. Everything's kind of bleak. What do you want to honor? Something you're, you're just in. You can get comfortable where you are, can't you? And they were. They were comfortable in their traditions. They were comfortable in their way of life. They were comfortable in the things that they had, even though those things weren't that great. 
But God will say, I'm breaking into your comfort. I'm breaking into your ordinary. I'm breaking into this time. And I'm going to do something that has never been done before. So Zechariah, you've got to answer us. He can't. He can't. So he points. He writes down his name. He is. Not his name, maybe. Or this is a possibility. His name is John. Now you want to talk about what causes heaven to open? Brother Gerald, I don't know. I, I don't know because it's always different. If you try to learn a formula with God, God will just laugh at you and say, I don't do formulas. I'm God. I'm, I'm not a vending machine. I'm, I'm not a switch. I am a living person and I will do what I please, but I can tell you what always works. Whatever manifestation it has, when you obey God, heaven responds. When you say, God, yes, I'll do it your way, God says, here, I'm going to show you what I can really do. The moment... The moment he said his name is John, nine months went away. When the, he said his name is John, the Holy Spirit from God came out of heaven and filled that old man's body and the priest became a prophet and the first words out of his mouth, the first things he says is not, I got my boy. The first thing he says, blessed be the God of Israel. Blessed be our Lord. Blessed be our Savior. He had a praise in his heart. This was not from this is not from Zechariah. God was speaking. God said, it's time for you to understand what I'm doing. I'm doing something in your day. God has arrived. You better pay attention. The stage is being set up. Everything's being put in place. It's about time for God to just show out in this world. Now, that's, I want you to focus on this passage as we look to the heart of this message today. Three things. He says, as God interrupts this family event for his own thing, for what he desires to do. He says, blessed be the God of Israel and blessed be the horn that he has lifted up. Now, let me explain to you what that Hebrew idiom means. It simply means like, like the ram's horn symbolizes their strength. Because you see them. Man, they just butt heads. Goats, they, they butt each other's heads. It shows their strength. And he says that, that's, that's the symbol that Israel took. This is God showing strength. This is your strength. This is a man's strength. He'd call his son his strength. This is my horn. This is my strength of my family, of my life. But he says, now, God... You have raised up a horn. God, you have raised up the strength of Israel. We've been without power. We've been without hope. We've been without an answer. We've been without a direction. But now you have lifted up a beacon. Now you have said, here is your hope. Here is your answer. Here is your way. And he spoke through Zechariah three things that were for them. Number one, to perform mercy. Zechariah went to the temple for a reason. Israel was still a sinful place. The traditions didn't take it away. The lambs didn't take it away. The doves didn't take it away. Their good works didn't take it away. They were still very much sinners. You had the, the, the Levites, they were doing a good job in the temple, but they were getting really cozy with the Romans too. You had the Pharisees that said, oh, we're righteous before God, but they were oppressing the widows behind their back. There was a lot of sin and iniquity going on, and God didn't need to come down and give them an applause. God needed to come down and give them some mercy. They had messed up. They had once again ruined their relationship with God, and God once again said, I have come to give you mercy. Mercy, not judgment. I have come to give you grace and not my wrath. To perform mercy. But also, number two, to remember His holy covenant. God, you made promises. God says, I'm here to fulfill my promises. When I make promises, I don't break them. When I make promises, I fulfill them. I don't forget. I don't fail. I don't lax. I Fulfill. I am here to fulfill those promises. Number three, and I love this, it's, it's always, all these are, are two verbs. To perform the mercy. To remember His covenant. And to grant us. Lord, after I got mercy, and after I got the promises, what else would I need? 
Even to this day, that's most all what we want. We want God to forgive us and we want God to fulfill His promises to us. We want His stuff and we want His forgiveness. But that wasn't all the promises of God. And He knew it. He says, this is what Scripture says, this is what's going to be fulfilled to grant us that we might serve Him without fear. With our enemies taken care of. And it wasn't just the Romans. See, the Romans were a problem, but so was their neighbors. And so was their communities. And so was all the things going on around. Those were enemies to their faith and to their relationship with God. God said those will be moved out of the way and you will have the power. You will be granted that you can serve Him without fear in holiness and righteousness all the days of your life. You would have true life that He has promised. Three things. Mercy, remembering us in promises and that we could live a new life for you. But that's not just for Zechariah, was it? It's for Israel. Yes. It's for Israel. It was not just a hope for a family. It was a hope for a nation. A hope for a broken people. Yeah. A hope for people who could certainly do their day to day, nine to five. They could do that. But there was nothing else out there. It ended. It was just a it's a struggle till death and then you're buried. No. Something else is happening here. And I believe in that promise that He's giving to Israel, I think we can look to us as well. Because as I read the end of this passage of, of, of Scripture that He shares with us, He says, not only is this happening, He speaks to His child what He's going to be. Not His fatherly blessings, but God's blessings on Him. But then He talks about what God's going to do. He says, through the tender mercy of our God, God is visiting us. But I love the words that he uses in verse 78. It's a word that basically means the sunrise. It means the sun's coming up on Israel. <laughs> it's been down for a long time. It's been dark for a long time. Our history is shrouded in darkness for the past 400 years. But just over that horizon, for the first time I see, something bright is peeking over it. Something is coming up above the horizon. We call it the sunrise, but that is not as evocative as, as what the New King James here. It's the day spring. Day is beginning to spring up on the horizon and more and more light is going to come until it is fully revealed the sun's coming up Israel and it's coming up not only for us because it says in the next verse he's going to give light to all who sit in darkness you see the sun is not just going to confine itself to a little nation in Israel it's going to spread throughout all the Middle East and then it's going to go a little further in the Roman Empire and then it's going to make its way to the British Isles and to India and to China it's it's going to shine all over the whole world from north to south to east and the west. The sun is going to shine upon all and all who long to come into its light will be taken in as children of the living God. Not new Jews, but the new house of God who is born both of Jews and Gentiles. All who want light to shine on them. It will come and His way He will lead the way of peace. America stands as one of those nations he was prophesying to. We're rich, but we don't have peace. We're affluent, but we don't have satisfaction. We know a lot, but we have not discovered the secret of happiness in any test tube, in any exploration, in any psychological analysis of this world. We still fail at the fundamentals of life, what makes us satisfied with life? It's because we can't look where it resides. 2,000 years ago it was accomplished. But now Jesus, what He did, is finished on us. He is up on high beyond our reach and beyond our sight. But He says, I have sent My presence in the form of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to find Him, you will find Him. It's in His church. It's in the people that He's called by His name. Because every tribe, every nation, every tongue is going to see that light. They're going to come to it. 
Here I am. <laughs> Here you are. And guess what? The Holy Spirit has come as much as it came on Zechariah. It has filled us, not so that we'll just have a shout, but so that we'll have an assurance that this day star, this day spring, this sunrise, it has risen, not just on the planet. It's risen in our hearts, which is where the need is. Zechariah knew that to be true. So for Israel of old, for your ills, there is mercy. If you thought God had forgotten you, He's not forgotten you at all. And there's still a way of peace open. There's still a way that has been made for you to find the peace that you have always longed for. It's a place of life. To that, Israel has been set up for the blessings of God. But we're not Israel. We're 96. Or Greenwood or wherever you are. But when He opens that promise for the light to shine upon all of us, the promise is the same. Jesus is the answer. Not just in hope anymore, but hope should be building in here for something less, for something similar but different. He is coming, but church, don't live for His coming. Don't just, just live for that appearance. That is coming and what a blessed day that will be. But if you wait for your life to begin when He appears, you're wasting your days because He saved you and didn't resurrect you. He saved you and left you. He saved you and told you to go back to work. He saved you and still told you to go back to that difficult family. He saved you and said, still go back in that situation. He saved you and then said, you're still going to go through struggles and hardships and heartaches, but you won't go alone anymore. You won't go alone Without my power, you won't go without my life. The hope has been born and it's coming to fruition. Jesus is coming. But let me tell you, Jesus is already here. He's going to come and change the world. But He's already changed me. And He changes me still. And He changes you still. And you suffer and you struggle. But you go on in God because there is someone greater in you that is greater than in the world around you. It is Jesus He is here. here in this place. We still need it in Greenland. We still need it in 96. We still need it in America. We still need it in the world. So Christmas matters. Don't let the naysayers wear down your faith. There's a guy called Steph Curry. I like listening to him. And he's a Celtic artist from Europe and in a very tough place. You think it's hard to be a Christian in America? Be one in Ireland. Where they have celebrated the ability to kill the children in their womb. Celebrated it in the streets. It's a tough place to be a Bible-believing Christian. And he sang this song. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Because you see, Steph... He knew what it was like to be, be, be in that darkness, be that oppressed thing. He knew what it was like to live on the streets. He knew what it was like to drink himself into such a stupor. He didn't know what hospital he was going to wake up in the next day. He knew what it was like for the doctor to look at him in the face and say, if you don't quit drinking, you are going to die. I don't care how old or young you are, you're going to die. But then he met Jesus. And all of a sudden when he met Jesus, the light came on and he said, I don't need you anymore. I don't need the streets anymore. I don't need the drugs anymore. All I need is him. And so I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And as is way too common today, somebody confronted him after his song. You guys are so talented. Your playing is so beautiful. It's too bad you're singing for a lie and delusion. Mm -hmm. He responded. He said, thank you for your kind words. It's not the first words I would think of, but thank God he knew how to handle it. Thank you for your time. Yes, this, this band is very talented. But let me ask you a question. What kind of music do you think we would make if we didn't live a lie or delusion? In other words, if we believe like you believe, you already said this music was beautiful. What would it be if we sang something else? What would it be? See, and he never responded. What can he say? Oh, you're making beautiful music to nothing. I'm making beautiful music to nothing. So then I can make beautiful music to your nothing? It doesn't work. It doesn't fit. 
See, the world doesn't understand. They, they can have all the reasons in the world why they don't want to believe in God, but they don't understand why I have a song. They don't understand why you have a song. I'm not just going to sit up here and, and, and thump this platform and say, oh, God is real. I've got a song. I'm going to say, I love him. I praise him. I give myself to him. They can't understand it. But they're not singing either. <laughs> I'm the one singing. I'm the one with joy. I'm the one with hope. What they don't understand is they're celebrating the dark. They can't understand what it's like living in the light. Zachariah, oh, he knew. Oh, he knew. And from that point on, he could release his son to be the child that God wanted. A road that would end up in the desert, living off of locusts and wild honey. A day that would be without wife, without children, without anything the world counts as important. And when he came out of that desert, he would preach at a river, and his whole life story would be dunking people and saying, you need to turn from your sins because the Messiah is on his way. What kind of life is that? He was mocked. He was laughed at. But people began to see a light, and they began to flood that river. They began to get dumped again and again and again in the river. And then one day, coming across the land, he stopped what he was doing. There. I'm enjoying preaching today, but I can't imagine this sermon. There. Right there. There is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. All to be in that day. Hope is fully realized. Jesus is here. Would you bow your heads? Mercy, remembrance, and life in God. Is there anything making you mute today? Let me ask you to stand. Is there anything still in your tongue? You can't praise because of what you're going through physically. You don't have a song because someone or someones, your family, your life, your community, your job, are oppressing pressing in on you, squeezing you? Or is there somebody else? You think about getting together as family and something, something just tightens in your heart. Because you know it's not right. There's darkness there. I want to enjoy happy times, but I know it's mixed. I know about this. I found out one of my cousins. He may have the march. This may be the last Christmas he ever has on this planet. That's serious. I don't know where his life is. His life has not been lived for Christ. Where he is at this moment, I don't, I don't know. I'm going to know. But it mixes. You can't just pretend everything's happiness and roses and stars and twinkling lights. There's darkness. There's oppression. The devil's still working. He's still pushing. He's still afflicted. He's still at work. The darkness has not lost its power. But can I tell you, the darkness still is eclipsed by the light. Yeah. 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 Darkness is strong, but Christ's light is stronger. You can't be saved from the darkness, but you can push it back because Jesus is is the light of the world. And Jesus resides in you. Jesus resides in me. It's time we step, stop tucking our heads and just let the darkness continue to encroach. And take a step forward and say, God, I believe your promises. I know I've made mistakes. I know my family's made mistakes. I know my co-workers are, are heathen. But I believe Jesus and your mercy. I believe in your power to change. I believe that you're here to forgive and not condemn. I believe you've not forgotten me. Maybe you like Zachariah. Maybe you've been praying and praying and praying and praying and there's nothing but words that come out of your mouth now. 
Tell you what my prayer is today. I'm praying for an angel beside your altar. I'm praying for when you're sending up that incense to God, that an angel shows up to you, that hope is sparked in you again. It's not tradition and it's not routine, but it's revelation. Something that nobody else could tell you, but God gives you assurance beyond any doubt. Because you need to walk in that hope. You need to have something build inside of you. It's time we start mourning the fall of the world and start celebrating Jesus still saves. This is where we are. This is, this is what it begins to look like Christmas. This Christmas as we heard today is all about Jesus coming to die. He's coming to save us. He's not coming to play nice with us. He's coming to save us. So, what's pushing on you? What's deafening your tongue? You can't speak. You can't, you can't celebrate. You can't sing. Let God give you hope today. And let that light break forth in your life. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if you need prayer at this altar, it is here. 